Welcome to the Alan Elkan Interviews, an unprecedented window into the minds of some of the most well-known and respected figures of the last 25 years. Today we are interviewing a very famous interior designer, estate, uh, garden architect. His name is Nicolò Castellini Baldissera, and uh, he recently published a beautiful book called Inside Tanger, Tangier, with the photographs of Guido Taroni, Inside Tangier, which was published by Vendôme Press. And we will talk later about a new project because you are on, on the verge of publishing a new book on uh, your hometown, Milano. And um, Nicolò uh, Castellini was born in Milano, raised in Milano in a very special home, which was uh, his family palazzo in a way, which was restored by his grand-grandfather Piero Portaluppi, who was, as you know, a very, very famous architect. And uh, even his father, Piero Castellini, is an architect. So um, Nicolò is following the tradition. And he went to study in London and uh, then he lived uh, as a gypsy a little bit, you know, from in London, in Paris, in Switzerland, in the United States but found his happiness by chance in the place where he is today, which is Tangier, a very special Moroccan city in the north of Morocco, facing two seas, right? The Mediterranean, or at least the Gibraltar and uh, the ocean. Uh, It stands at the gate of the Mediterranean, indeed. Because of another relative of yours, who was the very famous... Giacomo Puccini, you know, the famous uh, author of many, many well-known operas. You called your house in Tangier, where you are in this moment, Casa Tosca, right? Casa Tosca, that's right. It's a funny combination between the famous great-grandfather and my beloved Dachshund, who is not here at the moment, whose name is also Tosca. I thought... I couldn't escape the obligation. As you, as you said in a previous interview, that one of the most exciting experiences of your life was when you went for the first time at La Scala. I think you went to see the Nutcracker when you were a child. Is opera something that belongs to your life? It does, it did. Sadly, not so much lately as in the physical act to go. <laughs> to a concert, but I do listen to music and I'm an avid consumer of music and uh, and it's always been part of my life. I sadly have never taken it up myself, so I don't play any instruments, which is a big regret, but I try to make regrets, you know, not part of my (laughs) daily life. People who listen to us, who don't see us, don't know that you have a beautiful bouquet of flowers in your background. One very important thing uh, for you, besides interior decoration, we will talk about that later, is also gardening, right? You love flowers, gardens. Very much. I love gardening. I'm a complete self-taught gardener. And uh, I have to say that in spite of having brought up in a city that would never lead one to think having many gardens, I was fortunate enough to live in a home which has a lovely garden in the center of Milan. So I was accustomed to nature, garden trees, flowers, and the whole process of tending to a garden since I was as young as six. And it's always been a passion of mine, which I've always practiced on an amatorial level, really. Until, again, I came to Tangier and uh, met our mutual friend, Umberto Pasti, who's also a self-taught gardener. He went much farther with his experimenting, creating beautiful gardens. And the reason why I mention him is that he did my tiny garden in my home here in Tangier. It is through this process that I particularly learned a little bit more about plants and flowers. There's a funny story about the bouquet behind me. In fact, I was scolded 
by Umberto just yesterday because the book you see behind me is of Iris filifolia, which are extremely rare in Morocco. They are in extinction and they shouldn't be picked. In fact, uh, two days ago, I happened to go to the local market and I saw in a corner this very bunch of Iris filifolia. And um, obviously I couldn't resist, grabbed them, came home and put them in a vase. I posted on Instagram, I thought they were too beautiful not to be shared. A few hours later, I get this phone call from Umberto saying, listen, I don't want to interfere with your personal life, but you should know that you should go back to the flower shop that sold them to you. And you should tell them that they shouldn't be picked because these flowers are going into extinction and they only grow on a couple of hills near Tangier. And I felt rather silly having bought them. But I also thought that if it hadn't been me buying them, someone else would have come along and bought them. But I do now sort of (laughs) attending them as if they were the most precious flowers that in fact are very rare and won't be seen again. (laughs) (laughs) The legend wants that you went for the first time to Tangiers many years ago. You didn't know the place. You had people who wanted to assign you a job to do a house. They never did the house, but instead you fell in love and you bought a house which was a ruin and you turned it into Casa Tosca. And also, because of your passion for gardening, you also tell about the story of three beautiful palm trees that arrived from Marrakesh for your garden. So why did you fall in love with Tangiers and you decided to buy this house and you spent now as much time as you can there? The reason I fell in love with Tangier at that particular moment, which is back in uh, 2008, I had been to Tangier once before with my mother coming for a party by boat from the south of France. That was a, a whole adventure in its own right. And that was my first glimpse of Tangier happened in 1985. And it lasted less than two days. And then we shipped off again back to France. It always remained in my heart as a lovely postcard, really, printed in my mind. But I didn't make much of it at the time. And I kept coming to Morocco quite frequently, mostly to Marrakesh, which seemed to be the venue where everybody went. And that's also a reason why I'm not a particular fan of Marrakesh, because everybody goes there. And again, as you rightly mentioned, by chance, many years later, some French clients asked me, to come along with them to Tangier. They had in mind a project to open a Maison d'Hôte, which, as you rightly said, ended up never doing. In the meantime, I found myself here with a few more days to spare, and I started to look into real estate, which is um, something I enjoy doing wherever I spend more than a week, just for (laughs) fun, just to see what's around, what's available. And it's also a way to get into people's homes and, you know, to see how sort of the style, the lifestyle and um, investigate. It's a little bit of a peeping into some people's lives. This time, before Casa Tosca, I fell onto um, a house that was tucked in the Medina, which was a house that was completely projecting, had very few windows, only two windows. It was a small Riyadh, larger than average for Tangier standards much smaller if you compare it with those beautiful riads that you find in Marrakesh. And that was my first project, which I restored entirely over a period of a year and a half. And I lived there for six years. Then the Medina became a little too noisy and uh, I sort of had passed my test with the folklore of the, you know, night yelling and the night buzz and the sort of... um, the movida, if if you pass me the term, that was happening every night of every week of every month. And I didn't have a garden there. I had a roof garden, more of a roof terrace, very panoramic, overlooking the Bay of Tangier and reaching as far as, you know, the coast of Spain. 
but it didn't really allow me to plant any trees in the ground. And um, it was just by walking uh, with a friend who also happens to be a real estate agent along the Marchand, which is a residential area that starts close to the Kasbah and then stretches along on a plateau. It's like a ridge which used to be, especially at the turn of the last century, around the sort of 1900s to 1930s, um, a very residential area, uh, upscale. So it's full of small sort of freestanding villas in different styles. Most of them have a very European style. And I fell upon this ruin, which reminded me very much of the kind of homes that you find in Milan, in a Milan boulevard called Via 20 Settembre, near the park, which used to house all the big mansions of the most prominent Milanese families, the industrialists that were leading the scene at the time. So like the Falc, the Borlettis. So you found in Tangiers a kind of fil rouge with uh, uh, streets of Milan. But Tangiers, you said that Tangiers has been a very famous international platform for many years because it was a pauvre franc place and there were many, many different eccentric and extraordinary and talented foreigners and artists and writers and composers and that and eccentrics that lived in Tangiers. And then there has been a decadence of the city because King Hassan didn't particularly like uh, no, no. the north of Morocco. And That's now there is a, a new king, Mohammed, who is very close to Tangiers and has changed a little bit the, okay. the, the, the mood and the city. How do you feel? You have been for five or six months in um, lockdown in Tangiers. Therefore, you probably had a real feeling of uh, the real life of the place. How do you feel there? In what kind of place you feel you are? Well, I feel free when I'm here. And by free, I mean, I feel that everything exists in Tangier. Everything is possible still to these days. Maybe not to the eccentricity levels of the 60s and 70s and early 80s, but it's a city that offers shelter to people from every path of life. And um, and notably, foreigners have been attracted to Tangier because Tangier is a special part of Morocco. It's a pocket, really, within the country having benefited for many, many decades of the status of a zone franche or of a free zone and having been governed by different nations, it had always allowed a sort of a more liberal lifestyle. And if you like, uh, close to, you know, the edges such as, you know, money laundering, prostitution, free sex, all sorts of spies found their home temporarily in Tangier. When you decided to do the book inside Tangier with your friend and photographer Guido Taroni, what was the criteria? How many homes did you put in the book and how did you choose them? The book features 24 homes. We did select a little more. They were originally 30. Two, and uh, we had to, for editorial choices, dictated by space mostly, we ended up publishing 24 homes. They all belong to um, expats. There aren't, except for um, one appearance of a Moroccan friend, there aren't any Moroccan homes. It was a choice that at first I was quite sorry about, but that was dictated mostly by their reluctance to take part to this project, as I am a foreigner to this country. And uh, as the publishing house being American-based, they didn't feel comfortable about having us outsiders portray their lives. But how is it for you, who are the designer of many 
homes, including yours, to go into some other people's houses. I mean, what is your feeling? You would like to change everything? You would like no, to... No, not at no, all. To, no, no. I, you like them feeling, as they are? My feeling was always of great curiosity uh, when, uh, when it happened that I, didn't, that I hadn't been in these homes before. I have to say that I had been in most of the homes published before, so nearly I knew them all. But for me, the best part of this book was the work on the field. So when Guido and I went to the house, meeting the owner, not for the very first time, but, you know, for the first time in order to accomplish the project, to paint their lifestyle through photography and through their words, we asked them to tell us about their life, about why certain choices were made in their homes. What came out of all this encounters, meetings, and talks was an incredible mix of characters, of uh, nationalities, taste. Most of these houses have a fil rouge, have a, a link. Almost all these people have bookshelves. I mean, yes. you take pictures of so many different bookshelves, so it means that all these people like you like to read, right? I mean, there is a lot of reading in Tangiers. Yes, there is a lot of reading. And there is also a lot of, you know, Tangier is a is the city of disguise. I mean, some people have lots of books, but not necessarily have gone through any of them. But that happens elsewhere. But I have to say that the books in Tangier have a particular value to their owners because they've been traveling between homes. They are often the research, the exchange of uh, many people exchanging books, comparing notes, giving each other books as presents. But you are right. You are absolutely right. Every home in the book has a library. Another story is that you made the choice of white tangiers for Tosca, your house. You are recognized all over the world for your colors, right? From pink to mint green, from yellow, and especially your favorite color, which is peacock blue, right? That you have in your bedroom. That's right. Why? The fact that the city was white made it easier to create your palette of colors? I love it white outside, but otherwise, for me, white is a non-color. Hence, my passion for challenging white with (laughs) quite powerful hues, such as this pink behind me, is one of them. And it was achieved uh, after several trials and experimenting mostly live pigments of color, which Morocco is very rich with. In fact, it is a bit of a myth to think of Tangier as a white city because you need to walk through its narrow streets and you will never find the base of the buildings. It's customary here to paint them with a la chaux, with a calce, with the sort of whitewashed with the most beautiful palette of colors that range from pale blue to indigo to pink to yellow ochre. <laughs> Why is peacock blue your favorite color? Peacock blue is a recent love. In fact, I discovered it while I was choosing a color for my bedroom. I've always tried to find colors that I can sort of, they, they can soothe, particularly a bedroom where you have to sleep. So I did try in my past uh, sleeping in Pompeian red painted bedrooms or dark blue or orange. I went as far as orange. And I have to say that my sleep didn't benefit from it. So I I started to go for sort of more pastel colors. And this peacock blue came out quite by chance as we were mixing colors. We started with an idea of a blue, of a blue as in azul rather than deep blue. And then we got the right shade. Once we applied it on on the walls, we knew that was the one. That was it. Listen, we spoke about Tosca, about your home. But the most recent move of yours is that uh, Tangiers is the city of love, but you were living in many other cities and for a very long time in London. And recently, you moved back to Milano. You moved back in another 
neighborhood, the neighborhood of Brera, nearby Brera, because you didn't want to be on the the on the family the family thing. Let's talk about your job. What kind of person is not able like you to make his own house and comes to you and says, you know, I would like you to do my house? And what kind of experiences you have? I know also, for instance, I know that at the moment somebody told me that you are restoring an old Genovese palazzo, which must be a big, big job, but you probably also made small apartments, so you had very different kind of clients, I imagine. Absolutely. How do you deal with them? Well, I deal with them. I first like to establish a personal relationship to a degree, of course. I need to know who's in front of me. I'm trying to understand what their ideas are about the place they are going to be living in. And sometimes they come to me saying, we don't know what to do. We have no ideas. We don't know what we like, which I disagree with. I think that each one of us knows whether they like something or not. I mean, you may not have ever been confronted to make a choice of the sort, whether you like pink or over blue. But if you have to think about it, even you might be a writer, but, you know, and not particularly a color expert, I'm sure you would come up, if given the choice, whether you like it pink or blue, you would come up with an answer. And, you know, because I think that within us, whether it's our passion or our main skill or not, we do know what we want. It's just a matter to find out. It's a matter of sort of interrogating oneself and saying, do I like this? Or how do I see? We all have a vision. You are rather eclectic in your different things, right? For yourself and probably also for your clients. I'm trying the best for my clients. I am definitely very eclectic for myself. But of course, I have no restrictions with myself. So I'm allowed to do whatever it pleases within my walls and outside as well. But when I come to a client, often we do establish a thread of rules. You know, some people have very specific ideas and they say we don't want anything flowery on our fabrics or we hate the color red or we can't stand this and that. Some people don't have such strict limits. I wouldn't call it a limit. I mean, you know, they have ideas and I welcome ideas because I like to work with my client along with them. And because in the end, I believe that my job is to deliver a home, which is everyone's nest at the end of the day. It's yeah, but this is what I mean. It's very difficult it, because it is. you penetrate in the intimacy of someone's it, life and it, still it has to be his house or her house and not yours. You're right. In fact, there is a lot of psychological work to be done with my clients and that's what I enjoy the most, especially if there is a response. I mean, if we happen to get along, sometimes we don't go beyond the first meeting and the job doesn't happen. You know, it's also a matter of feeling of first impression when, when you meet somebody for the first time and you're discussing their future home, you know, you might also disagree on everything and uh, ending up with a handshake and say, look, I'm not the right person for you. Are clients similar in different countries? or I wouldn't classify them specifically, but I can tell you that there are differences between countries. Americans, for instance, have a very specific idea of what a decorator should be doing. And the decorator should be doing, in their opinion, just being an executioner of ideas that should be pleasing their something that they have an idea of what the house should look like. They're incredibly demanding. They're also incredibly generous <laughs> when it comes to one's fees. You know, America allows a decorator to thrive financially. Europe is a different story. The financial aspect is not as rewarding, but I don't do this for money. I do it and I do it well only when there is, a, what I mentioned before, when there is an une entente, when there is an, uh, an understanding. But tell me something, you talk about money, right? 
what do you try to do? Some people try to make other people spend more money. Others try to save money. What yes. is your relationship? Because I imagine that you have not only to paint walls, but you have to buy, who knows, chairs, couches, tables, objects, uh, fireplaces. How do you work? Do you have a budget? Do you Thanks. insist on something? How does it work? Are your clients mainly very wealthy people? Not only for your own fee, but for the spending in the decoration. The spending, of course. Well, there's definitely a budget that has to be discussed. Very few people give you carte blanche financially, but some do, and that's wonderful. It happens uh, rarely, but it does. In which case, I do still tend to work along with the client because I wouldn't just run out there and buy whatever I like. I still would like to go through with the owner of the place about things that I think would look good, but I would also like them to understand why they would look good. But there is a lot involved, and the budget is fundamentally one of the pivotal keys to this profession, you know. But I don't necessarily believe that you need a big budget to achieve a nice uh, result in decorating a house. A house can be a wonderful, charming house with very little There are also people which have been very fortunate in meeting many of that have things of their own already. They've been collecting, they have family heirlooms, which I very much encourage to repurpose, to recycle. I love recycling things. I am a master at recycling in my own homes. In fact, this house is a collection of furniture, objects, paintings coming from five different homes around the world. And every time I look at them, it makes me smile that that armchair used to be in uh, my home in the mountains or that that picture, can't see any at the moment, you know, used to be hanging on my wall in my Parisian apartment and so on and so forth. Didn't you inherit this vision from your grand-grandfather, Piero Portaluppi, who being a modernist designer, loved to mix a mix of antiques from around the world in his modern houses. I certainly was influenced by his style. I sadly didn't meet him as he died the year before I was born, but I did have the great chance of visiting his house because his widow, my great-grandmother, outlived him by 11 years which made me 10 when she died. And since the age of six, I used to go for lunch at her house every Thursday. And the house had not been touched since his death. So I could breathe without him, his own home style. And that was definitely uh, an influence. An influence that I at first ran away from because I thought it was rather stuffy. I was too young to understand the architectural value of some of his details that I'm now crazy about and, uh, and a great fan of. But my major influence was mostly my father, who was, in fact, maybe closer to my generation than my great-grandfather, for obvious reasons. And he was there, he was alive, And his homes, we had a chance to live together for a few years. And then when my parents separated and later divorced, I then moved between his place that was ever-changing. And you could be certain to visit my dad one week and see a setup in the room. And going the next week, that setup would be something else, gone. And often implying the color of the walls and, you know, extreme changes took place very, very regularly. And that was the greatest influence. When you spoke before about the simplicity and the fact that also with not much money, you can get a beautiful or at least a very rewarding result, I thought of your passion or interest for Japan and its architecture, especially when you were young. And in the same time, when somebody, I think from the New York Times or other newspaper, asked you which was your favorite uh, house, 
you spoke about Villa Necchi, which was uh, built by your grand grandfather Portalupi in uh, the center of Milano, right? That's and, correct. And these two ideas, the Japan and the Villa Necchi, are very influential in your work, aren't they? They are in the sense of, again, of the Japan in the way of the beauty of simplicity and the beauty of the artifice because everything in Japan is calculated. It's perfect to a degree that it nearly reaches a certain retentiveness, which I, though, appreciate enormously because they, and only they, I find, have this art of displaying perfectly everything in a perfect balance. And yet it feels natural. And uh, in fact, it isn't. It's a whole process that takes ages to achieve. And it's like aiming to perfection. I am a bit messier, but I do admire it elsewhere. In fact, during my first trip to Japan, which was only recent, I, well, as recent as 10 years can be, I was mesmerized by their gardens, by the way that they control every single little stone, every single leaf as its place. And if, you know, it follows the seasons and the blossoming, it's quite the opposite of, of something wild. And, and how is the Lamecchi? I find it a stunning example of a vision, of a vision if you put it into context. If you think of a Milan society in uh, the late 20s, early 30s, and also of the fashion that accompanied those years, uh, to see a house of this incredible modernity and yet with some important innovation, technological innovation, such as, you know, sash windows that came, you know, the front gate disappearing into the ground, these large aluminum panel doors that slide into to lock out the most exposed areas of the house for security reasons, but they're made into something beautiful and unique and the lavish use of materials from marbles to woods, to wood veneers. Villaneki is the quintessential, to me, it represents the best example of the Milanese bourgeoisie, haute bourgeoisie, uh, industrial, hardworking people that though want to establish their status, but again in a low-profile way, because it's not a grand house. You regret it and don't regret it because it has a lot to do with you. When you did your book on Tangiers, at the end of the day, you choose a very special expat people, right? International people who, for one reason or the other, love Tangiers and built or restored or um, decorate their own house. Maybe I am wrong that you're not going to do expat homes in Milano, right? Your hometown. No, no probably sadly. going to do Milanese houses and uh, probably you will, one of them will be Villanecchi, but this is something I don't know. I can tell you that sadly Villanecchi will not be uh, included in the book for the simple reason that it is not a private home anymore. It's open to, book, to the public and we are only going to publish private homes and interiors. Also, the problem with the Villaneki would be that if we did include Villaneki, we would then be obliged to include other open museum homes. How many homes are you going to portray? And uh, after so many years out of Milan, you know, being abroad and around the world, probably apartments or houses have changed quite a lot since yes, you were have. a child, right? Some have. My target is to make a book that gives an idea of our city, of Milan, as a very eclectic one with different styles and from different professions, from different categories, from, you know, the Milan of fashion, the Milan of architecture and design, the old Milan with its old palazzis that are still in very much in, uh, in place and running 
and uh, the Milan of the music, of the opera, the Milan that offers sort of a wider range of, of people like writers, journalists, uh, entrepreneurs. With book, houses with bookshelves. Always. I'm a passionate, you know, although you can't see downstairs, I have my library. <laughs> it's not... <laughs> It's, um, but being you a cosmopolitan, a citizen of the world, what made you come back to Milan? To be entirely honest, I felt like I had done my duty abroad and in fact, duty called back home. So the main reason of my not so sudden return to Milan was due to some family business that needed my attention, really. At the same time, it happened at the moment in my life when I had just turned 50, where I found the need to go back to my roots, the same roots where I ran from 32 years previously. The city has changed quite a lot. The city has changed dramatically. I came back to a Milan that was vibrant, full of uh, international people, foreigners, a city that had just come out of a very successful expo that brought Milan back on, a, on the international scene. A lot of projects were taking place. You can still see buildings and skyscrapers uh, that are ambitiously <laughs> popping up and um, changing the Milan skyline. And I hope they'll carry on because personally, I think there are too few for now. We need more. But I found a city that was um, back on track. When I left it in uh, the late 80s, Milan was a dark place by many means. And um, I found it very claustrophobic. Also because of the structure of Italian cities, societies are tight. And... Um, I think that our country, I think Italy lacks a sense of nation. One is a Milanese before being Italian. One is Roman before being Italian. One is Florentine before being Italian. Unlike the French, who are French, and they have this sense of nation, and they have a sense of belonging to France. Italians belong to their city first, and then Italy comes along a bit limping. And I would love to see a unified country where Italians would be a little less provincial. You said very sincerely because of your roots, because of your family, because you are a Milanese and you're not responsible of your birth, right? And, no, and plus no. you come from a prominent family with talented people. And so uh, you, you're certainly proud of it. Also because you spent, you know, from the fog of Milano, you spend a lot of time in Tangiers. So you're not exactly a Milanese, right? Yes, I'm a Milanese. I'm a sort of a prodigal son. But, but then <laughs> I'm also cutting out some space in the real sunshine on the coast of... But uh, talking about Italy, uh, it comes out from your biography that you have sincere love for two very extraordinary cities like Venice and Palermo, right? And That's correct. Your favorite painting is the Madonna dell'Annunciata of Antonello da Messina that sits in Palermo. Are you curious now that you have this big job in Genova to discover another Italian city that is less on the Ribalta, less, uh, less so. well-known. Yes. Yes. It is a challenge for you. What is it? Well, I've always been very curious. Curiosity is one of my main drives. And uh, I've been thrilled to discover Genoa, which I admit was a city I knew very little about, although I'd been there several times, never as extensively as I have over the last few months. And again, as you rightly said, it's, an, it's, you know, undervalued. And as many of our cities, I think Italy has the widest array of most beautiful cities that are mostly unknown to the rest of the world. And there's a lot to be done with Italy in that respect. We have a treasure that often we don't know what to do with. And I believe there's plenty to do with it. It's a matter of 
getting more in love with our country. And I think we've been, in a way, if you allow me, too spoiled. I think that being born with it, you take things for granted. So you lose the enthusiasm of a person coming for the first time. I was very lucky to bring some of my best friends from America for the first time to Venice. And it was the most beautiful time I've ever had to see them arriving in a place like Venice, which we're now using Venice as the maximum example of Italian beauty, and to see their faces like, you know, a child who discovers some joy for the first time. Did you work in Venice? I did work, not as much as I wish. I hope I will work more. And uh, funnily enough, it's a city where I would love to live. And um, it's a little... Tangiers will be, if you live in Venice, Tangiers will become a little jealous. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's the water feature. I have discovered over the years that I love to live in cities that have water. And uh, maybe not as much water as Tangier does, having the Atlantic and the Mediterranean Sea, or as Venice does with the Adriatic. But even cities with the, what I'm missing a lot in Milan is a river and the Navigli. In fact, when you read Stendhal, uh, who described Milan as one of the most beautiful cities in, in the world, according to his knowledge, and all these corsi d'acqua, all these canals, I mean, Milan must have been absolutely charming. And um, it takes a bit of imagination today, but... I miss water in Milan. Besides missing water in Milan, and besides Genova and Tangiers and your new apartment in Milan, do you have any other important project in front of you, I mean, or that you are particularly in love with? Well, I am in love with a new project. I don't know whether it's that important. It's important to me. I'm designing furniture in Tangier, which allows me to be here often. It gives me the excuse to come and check on the production. I have always loved rattan furniture and uh, I've produced a line of furniture accessories, as I like to call them, and which are produced in Tangier. Of course, needless to tell you, the name of the brand is Casa Tosca. Uh, You are obsessed with Tosca, right? Obsessed with Tosca. One of my favorite operas. So obsessed, as as I said, I named my favorite dog. And also this new line of furniture. And And your house. And my house, which had no name. I want to specify because I would have never changed the name had it had one. But the house didn't have a name. So I decided to give it. And how is your house in in Milan has a name? Well, my house in Milan has a nickname. (laughs) But I don't, I'm, not, I'm not sure that your viewers will understand it. It's Lo Squallidone. When I first found it, it's a rented apartment. So I found this very sad, squalid. Squallidone means very banal, big, flat, spacious, but without any particular feature of interest, which, of course, gave me the chance to play with colors. I it's really, like the, ta- the white of Tangiers, right? Yes. The, the white, I transformed this beige, large, rather standard apartment into a box of colors. Which <laughs> colors? The same ones that you have there or something else? I introduced a deep blue in a bedroom and a yellow, which is missing in Tangier. But I still use pink in a different shade and uh, not quite a peacock blue, but similar in the living room. But the great novelty was the gold walls and ceilings in the dining room. There are two items which are very important in a house, which are the kitchen and the bathroom, right? Yes. How do you conceive them? Do you have a special taste for kitchens and bathrooms? I have a, more of a taste for bathrooms, which I like to be uh, places where you can also sit in other than in your bathtub. So I like bathrooms that have enough space to allow a chaise, like a, an armchair or sort of a, some sort of sitting, because I do enjoy conversations 
from my bathtub with some special guests. You me. don't like showers. I do have a shower, but that's the practical side of the bathroom because I do take <laughs> showers. But if I entertain in the bathroom, I would entertain from the bathtub, not from the shower. What about the kitchen? The kitchen is not my favorite. It's not my strong point. I'm definitely a foodie. I love food and I love good food, but I, I'm not a good cook. I'm not a cook at all. So I leave the but kitchen. How should be the aesthetics of the kitchen? The kitchen should be also um, more and more these days. I find a place of conviviality where you can sit down around the table. So I tend to decorate my kitchens, often leaving the practical aspect behind. That's a criticism that has been moved to me often saying, you know, your kitchens, they're very pretty to look at, but then they're not very practical because where do you put your pans? Where do you... I'm not very practical in designing kitchens. And that's why I rely on great kitchen designing firms who do the dirty job of putting together, you know, those drawers, cupboards, things where you range stuff. But, uh, but nowadays when people cannot go to restaurants uh, or to bars as they are obliged to stay home because of the coronavirus. Obviously, the kitchen must have taken much more importance in, in, in their life. life. Yes, definitely. I do try <laughs> to eat in the dining room so that I can avoid the kitchen. But sometimes it's nice to be in the kitchen and it's less work. And so my kitchen in Milan is quite jolly you know we've been hanging pictures i've treated Which it color it's an aqua it's a teal blue green and um i have been hanging fragments of islamic tiles portuguese tiles i also have a collection of prints 18th century prints of milan views of milan so it's more of a room of a living room than a kitchen And except for those... And in your lifestyle, what do you do? You mix the Milanese risotto and uh, Moroccan tagine. I mean, how do you conceive no. <laughs> your kitchen, your, your cooking? My cooking is quite traditional. I'm a, I'm a big lover of our Italian cuisine. And the second best is Japanese. Moroccan isn't my favorite. They tend to overcook everything here. And so even here, I imported our wonderful cuisine. So we do wonderful pastas and wonderful vegetables. And you still love more than anything else the pasta with vongole? The famous pasta vongole. Yes. And I'm very, very lucky because we had a great fish market in Tangier. So I get the best vongole. Also for flowers. Flowers and, and, um, and flowers, as, as you mean in Fiori. Fiori. You buy a lot of flowers at the market, right? I buy all my flowers at market. And the beauty of Tangier is that you only find the flowers that are in season. So this is the iris season. And so we've been blessed with tons of irises. But soon we'll have many other species of beautiful flowers. The winter is a little trickier. In Tangier, you feel it mostly with the lack of flowers, which is never a total lack of flowers. There are always flowers, like the narcissus, where in January, you know, they call them paper whites in English. And they smell divinely. And you find them by the hundreds. And the great thing about Tangier is that you can also afford to buy them, which is something that you couldn't in London or Milan. You know, the amount of flowers that you can bring home. Nicolò, we could talk for hours. It has been extremely interesting to go through some of your lives, some of your tastes, a little bit of your job and the mixture of your life, job and house, which is very much the same, if I am not wrong. You know, you're absolutely right. They all go together. They merge into who I am. They are all part of myself, of my life, and I'm very happy about it. Well, thank you very much and lucky well, you who you. are in Tangiers with all these flowers and thank and you good for luck See thank you very much alan elkan interviews